Nieuwspot, die thuiste vir Afrikaanse stories achter die nieuws. Verkeersboetes behels meer als een klein ongerief met minimale gevolgen. Jij kan een criminele record krijgen of problemen tegenkomen als jij jouw rijbewijs of motorlicentie her niet. En die metropolisie kan jou bij padblokkades lastig val om die boetes te betaal. Fines for You verminder moeite met verkeersboetes die rol te monitor en vinnig, wetlik en effectief af te handel, so dat jy nie die ongewenste gevolge hoef te dra nie. Ons specialiseer in groot vloote en streef daarna om jou geld te bespaar. Contact ons gerus op 011-867-7331 of besoek ons webtuiste by www.finesforyou.co.za Good day to the leader of the DA, John Steenhuisen. Going for a second term, uh, he's sitting with me in my virtual studio. John Steenhuisen, welcome to New Spot. It's like great to be with you and great to be with the New Spot family. Um, it's really always a pleasure to be on your show. And in my best free state English, I'm going to um, try and uh, get some more information about your quest for becoming uh, the leader for a second term of the DA. But we understand each other, man. <laughs> Whether we talk free state English or not. Of my KwaZulu Natal Afrikaans. Yeah, well, but yeah, I, <laughs> yes, you, you are actually doing very much better than uh, Tony Leon did uh, with Don't his. Don't tell him uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking, Tony. Please, uh, if you watch this, it's really just a joke, man. Uh, <laughs> But Tony did quite a, a bit of effort. He gave it quite a bit of effort in those days trying to to do the Afrikaans thing. And and I can hear yourself as well. John, jeez, man. I, I, I can see, I, 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 because I follow you, I can see this is hard work. Um, and, and, and sometimes taking you away from your family and for four years now, now you want to do it for a second term. Why? Because I love the job, uh, Isaac. And yes, it is tough and there are tough days. But I think that goes with any job. You know, you have good days and you have bad days. And you have good runs and you have bad runs. Um, and But I love this job. I love politics. Um, I've been in politics since I was a young guy and of 17. I was first elected at 22. So... You know, I'm like a shark. You got to keep moving, otherwise you, you, otherwise you die. And I mean, that's a big thing. Keep moving, and keep. On, and I'm passionate about uh, about particularly the next 18 months. We've now really finally got a chance, after 75 years, to end one party majority rule in South Africa. And I think that's exciting. And that's certainly what's giving me energy and drive to get out there and fix things. And I, I'm very proud of where my party is and where we're going. And I want to lead it into that uh, that moonshot election uh, because I think change is coming to South Africa and I want to be part of it. What makes you believe in the DA, um, the DA of today, the one that you are leading and that one that you want to lead for a second term into this turmoil of uh, South yeah, African I, I believe politics? Fun- yeah. I believe fundamentally in the value, the core values and principles of the DA the Open Opportunity Society. I believe in freedom, fairness, opportunity, and diversity. But the core values of the DA um, have have been unchanging uh, over generations. It's non-racialism, respect for the rule of law and the constitution, a market economy that treats the business and private sector as partners in growth and job creation, and building a capable state that's able to deliver. Those are the core foundational principles that have guided this party since way back when, when it was first started. And I think it's those those principles and values which will ultimately prevail in government. Yanni Staitler, uh, former DP, PFP, uh, Progressive Party stalwart, uh, famously said that one day South Africa will be governed by our values because it is the only way it can be governed. And it's a recognition of people as, as individuals, not as envoys of their race, Recognition that every culture and language matters, that no one culture or language should dominate others, and the freedom of people to make their own choices and to trust them to make the right choices 
are the core hallmarks of uh, the only way South Africa can be governed, particularly given the different races, tribes, languages, cultures that exist. Respect for those and seeing people rather as individuals rather than envoys of all of those things is, I believe, fundamental to making South Africa successful. Uh, we had years of, of, uh, of white nationalism. We've now had a three decades of African nationalism. I think it's time to try something different. And I think the DA offers that difference. And that's um, why I fundamentally believe that we have to be the core of a new majority by 2024 so that we can make all of these things a reality for South Africa. I've had the privilege um, of, of, of seeing you, of, of, of uh, experiencing you in your, um, uh, in your time within the DA since you've been uh, chief whip of the party. Um, I had the privilege of, of having to watch you every day while I was reporting for RSG, Monitor and Spectrum. Um, and I, sometimes I was in the parliament as well. Um, and, and now I I see you as the leader of the DA. I've seen some changes in you, um, but I'm not going to tell you now. Uh, what do you think changed? Uh, have you grown? Yeah. 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 So I think uh, there are two very different roles, but being the chief whip um, and being the leader. Uh, the chief whip uh, is always more of a street fighter um, and spends a lot more time in parliament in the trenches, uh, you know, fighting in the rules committee, doing sweeps, you know, being the sharp tongue in the debates. I think when you become the leader, um, you have to step back a little bit and develop more of a mantle of, of being the statesman, um, of being able to be the responsible person in the room and being able to inspire confidence of people that you are in charge of a situation and you, you know what needs to be done. So it was a transition. It wasn't an easy transition, I must tell you, Isaac, because I really loved being the chief whip. Um, I love the cut and thrust. And that, but it has been important to develop a new style um, in order to be able to grow your set of skills as a leader and to be able to appeal to a wider audience as well. Uh, and so I think people, you know, the chief whip is very much the, the, the bulldog uh, or the bull terrier. The leader, I think, has got to be more of the Alsatian that's leading the way forward. And um, I think that's the that's the transition. Um, was it a perfect transition? Probably not. And I think as leaders, we need to accept that there's always something that we can improve, that we're not perfect beings, um, but that we must recognize what our shortcomings are and, and try our best to uh, to to set up uh, systems against them, uh, and to bring people around you that that help you in those particular uh, areas where you are perhaps not very strong. I want to stay there for a moment, if you don't mind. Um, mm. uh, I I asked you this question to answer it first uh, for a reason, uh, because it sounds much different than the one mm. I'm going to read to you now. Uh, I'm going to mm. quote someone from Mail and Guardian. Um, saying it is not, uh, uh, as for Democratic Alliance leader John Stiernason, he gradually and then expeditiously became more uninspiring in just about every public outing as he warmed his leadership chair. It is not that his content is weak or delivery poor. It's simply that his personality has evaporated since the days of being the official opposition's chief whip. The once quirky, fast-talking and aggressive debater has been reduced to a staged and scripted party. Mm -hmm. I'm well, sorry I'm laughing, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would just say I'm very lucky that I've got more Instagram followers than the Mail and Guardian <laughs> has readers. Um, and, um, and I'm looking forward to winning my case against them at the Ombudsman this week, which is probably why they're a bit... They've got a bit of a seerchat, um, uh, and they wrote that. But yeah, um, <laughs> um, I, I am... Um, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping for an answer like that. Uh, I started laughing, so I gave my game away. But um, yeah, I just wanted to juxtapose that a little bit. John, do you drink coffee? Um, I do drink coffee, but I prefer tea. Really? Um, I, yeah. Oh, okay. I like uh, I like Earl Grey tea and rooibos tea in the mornings. But I, I do have a coffee machine here, and it's got me through many late nights and early mornings. I have a very good friend that makes this um, coffee, Captain Zamur. He makes great 
chili sauce. Yes, uh, he well. does. Captain Brunt. You know Captain that. Captain Brunt and Ani Brunt, and they I... are excellent. And I'm very proud to say I have always a bottle of them in my fridge at home. I have the it's actually made from mango, which uh, yes. but it, the, the chili sauce is super. Yes. I'm a big hot sauce fan. And that uh, those guys are one of my favorites. He, I haven't tried the coffee yet, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna make a plan to try some. He, he made a new sauce now. Uh, he calls Ulevi Brown, which is made okay. of olives, which is just as beautiful. I have the privilege of staying uh, in his garden flat. Um, oh wow! Well, so, you can tell him that that the leader of the opposition is a huge fan, <laughs> and I never ever have a fridge that doesn't have uh, a bottle of Ani Brunt or. Or Captain Brunt in the uh, in the fridge. Okay, then I'm not going to send you coffee. I'll send you um, I sent you a bottle of sauce then, uh, chili sauce. But I love mm. the coffee. Mm. And when I told Helen the other day that it's uh, called Captain Samur, she was mm. checking me out like a, a mother check out checks out a younger son. <laughs> Did you just swear or something? <laughs> <laughs> anyway well you don't have to worry about me uh Isaac. if you read the newspapers you know i'm x-rated so it's fine <laughs> but um uh, it's interesting listening to you and how you see it i i, I think um uh, it, it's uh, in south africa there's so many views on 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 politics at the moment um i had a, an, a, a conversation with uh, pete crowcamp the other day uh, oh, he very, doesn't like me. He's not a big fan was, of mine. He was very critical of you mm -hmm. um, and, and, and saying that you are not really the leader that the DA needs at the moment. Um, do you want to comment on that? Uh, you know, Pete's never been a fan of mine and you know, I respect his views entirely. Um, he backed my opponent in the last election in the DA and, um, well, we all know how that ended. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he's entitled to his opinion. Uh, I respect that. Um, I fundamentally disagree with him on many things. And yes, I've done a lot of things wrong in my life, but I've never locked a colleague in an office. Well, I was <laughs> going to say, I was going to say, I was a cool one. Peter, you listen. I think it's a good comeback. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, John, uh, the next four years, it, it's uh, two of them uh, are going to be very critical. The next two are going to be even more critical. Uh, what do you see ahead uh, for the party uh, as you will probably step out as, uh, as the uh, leader for a second term? Well, look, I mean, obviously what, what I will have to do if I'm re-elected is direct the party's resources and focus the party on preparing for the 2024 election. I think we've laid a lot of the groundwork already. We uh, have uh, got ideological coherence again through our policy conference, uh, which is very firmly set out who we are, what we're about, who we're fighting for. Uh, and then it's about getting out and raising the money and then getting out and, and convincing people uh, that what they need to do if they want to see a successful South Africa is to give me a huge pile of blue chips in other words, votes, so that I can go to the high-stakes poker game after the 2024 election and play a hand that's going to win for South Africa. And I can only do that with voter support. So that's going to be the focus, is speaking to people, giving them hope that that really, and I do mm. feel hope that things are going to change and that we can start to build a new majority in South Africa and that we can get off this terrible trajectory that we're on and build something better. Um, and I think that that hope is something I want to take across South Africa um, as well. But, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a tough campaign. You know, a wounded buffalo is a dangerous animal. And I think the ANC is bleeding. I think they're on their knees. But we mustn't write them off just yet uh, mm. and, and regard everything as a done deal. We've got a hell of a fight ahead of us. Mm. Um, and we need to prepare for that. And that's certainly what I'll – building up a war chest, getting troops ready – so we've got a big pro program this year that we've spearheaded called My DA, My Branch to get activists uh, in every ward, in every municipality around the country. And uh, that's what I want to do. I want to be able to lead that blue army into that election and emerge, hopefully, uh, with a significant chunk of votes to turn into uh, a better future for the country. 
if everything goes uh, according to the predictions, uh, current predictions, there is a possibility um, uh, that you will then uh, step up as President John Steenhuizen. What then? Yeah. So, so I mean, obviously, you go out all out to to get as many votes as as you want. And we, we're in a party system. We're not in a presidential system. Um, so it's all about getting votes for the party. Um, I don't think the DA is going to get 50% plus one, if I'm honest with you, Isaac. I mean, I'd love to to drink some Captain Samur and and tell you that, but it's it's unlikely. I think that we are looking at a coalition. And I think that coalition yes. will have to sit down and determine who will take up which positions um, within, you know, you know, within that coalition. Um, and I think that is a decision for, for a later stage. My goal now is you know, not to look at Tainhase, but to look at the union buildings and and that's uh, and Parliament, and that's where the focus is. Um, if we were in a presidential system, I would say it, it's far more important to be worrying about things from that perspective. But we have a parliamentary system, and it comes down to which party gets which number of votes in the House, um, and you know you then have have an election in the House for those key. Uh, those key positions. So um, I think there's still a lot of road to travel. Um, I'm not saying I'm not interested in the job. I'm not saying I think I, I wouldn't do a great job, but I'm saying that's a uh, distorties for an under dach uh, or the focus no is or who can I tell if and I blow stem in the stem bus cray and then this the mees belangrikste. Talking about those votes, I want to come back to the coalitions just after this. Uh, let me just speak on about the, about the votes. Um, it it seems like the DA uh, does not get that that crucial vote uh, of 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 the the people on the ground, those ones that we need to steal from the ANC. Um, yeah. Do you have plans for that? Uh, am I wrong if I if if that is my um, uh, view of it? Uh, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, I would say that it's, I wouldn't ever say you're wrong because it's your show and you never tell the host that they're wrong. <laughs> but I would say that uh, that that the question is misdirected. Um, I think if you look at what happened in Inyanga, for instance, in Cape Town this last week and the last round of by-elections, I mean, our support went up exponentially in a all-black ward. Um, so we are getting through there. And it's also the reason why we're winning TVET College uh, campuses in Limpopo, in rural Limpopo. It's why we won the SRC presidency at uh, at the University of the Free State. And it's why we are winning the SRCs at Nelson Mandela um, University in the Eastern Cape. It's because more and more young, particularly black South Africans, are realizing that there's no need to be emotionally tied to a party, that you've got to vote for your future, and that there is a there is a link between how you vote and how you live and how you vote and what opportunities are going to be available for you. And I think as that younger voter set has become available, 18 to 35, that's where we're starting to make big inroads. So I think we're going to surprise a lot of people. I mean, I'm very comfortable when I look at the our internal polling, we're starting to outpoll the EFF amongst black South Africans. Um, and I think there's, there's a significant growth. And I think it's also born out of the fact, uh, Isaac, if I may, uh, that we are driving issues in Parliament and other things that matter to ordinary South Africans. Gone are the days of debating who's a better liberal or who's a socialist, mm. who's this or that. We're talking about things like cutting VAT on chicken so that we can get protein into the bellies of hungry citizens, of reducing the fuel price so that we don't have exponential costs of, for businesses and the like. We're talking about uh, bread and butter issues that matter to ordinary South Africans. Um, and I think that's what matters. I also think that there is a misconception, a large part of the mainstream media, that this is a party that is you know, only interested in white business. Uh, when in fact, the opposite is true, that we have the only party that's championed black property ownership in the country through title deeds and the like, that we went to court for Mr. David Rechatze's right to own the farm, which he was promised, and why we've complained to the Human Rights Commission about the inequality that exists in rural areas where large populations of black South Africans are locked in serfdom 
mm. uh, and unable to own the land that they live on or work in. These are not white business issues. These are bread and butter issues that matter to ordinary South Africans. And so we are seeing the needle moving and I'm very encouraged by that. And I think we're gonna surprise a lot of people uh, in the next election, uh, particularly in that voter market. Uh, if, if things do not go uh, according to the prediction, um, and it goes uh, slightly to the other way, the ANC um, uh, uh, being stronger than we we thought they are, um, it means that they will still be a big reality and in our politics, and and, and we will have to um, uh, to uh, ca count that in uh, into the sum. Um, would it would it would it be a possibility that the DA uh, would talk to uh, the then ANC uh, about the possibility of coalitions? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, it's like, um, I've got to be very careful I answer this because there's been a bit of mischievous uh, writing recently by the unelected president, self-appointed of a, of a smaller political party, who's going around saying to everyone that we're going into bed with the ANC. I, I would just answer that and say I've spent my entire adult life and political career trying to get the ANC out of office. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be working to keep the ANC in office mm. through, through any way, shape, or form. So our primary goal is to bring the ANC below 50%. Uh, there, I, I think it's 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 too early to put all your eggs in one basket right now, um, ahead of the 2024 elections. But I would say this. I think the worst-case scenarios for South Africa are either the ANC retaining their majority, in which case the current trajectory will continue, or an ANC EFF tie-up, because I think the prospects of that for the country would be devastating. Mm. We would be on a fast track to Venezuela or Zimbabwe before you know it. If we look how much the EFF has been able to extract from the ANC, from the opposition benches, Kronten Anning, Sona Fuchuding, nationalization of the Reserve Bank, um, uh, uh, prescribed assets, all those types of things, Imagine what they will squeeze out of the ANC if they actually are reliant on them for a, for a coalition. So I would approach 2024 on the following basis. We will talk to any parties that share the core foundational values of the DA, non-racialism, respect for the rule of law and the constitution, a market-based economy, and a capable state free of cater deployment. We will talk to anybody who, who shares those foundational values and principles. We will then work backwards from those worst case scenarios, an ANC majority or an EFF ANC type, and then obviously try and work out what the least worst option is and the best possible mm. outcome for South Africa uh, would be. But that's only going to be possible um, when we we know where the chips lie and and what the votes are uh, in in the box. So I want to dispel this notion that, that's being spread that we are busy negotiating uh, a coalition with the ANC. It's not true. Mm. Yeah. Um, but we will we but we, we will have mm. to make a decision after the next election about do you mm. stand back and let the radical left take control of the country? Mm. Is that in the best interest of your voters? So there's going to be a lot of introspection that has to be done by all parties after that particular election to decide what the future is for South Africa. But I certainly will be doing everything I can do to prevent the radical left from getting into control of the lever of powers because I think that it would be fundamentally disastrous for the country. So that will be the worst case scenario. We'll work backwards yeah. from there, I imagine. And it'll depend how well some of the other parties do. And maybe if they stopped attacking us and started focusing on their votes, it would help. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we're focused on at this stage, bringing the ANC below 50%. Otherwise, there's no game in town. Listen, no, I'm, try I'm not trying to catch you out on something. I know, uh, I know you're uh, not. <laughs> uh, what I'm actually trying to do is, there, there's talks um, uh, amid certain uh, analysts uh, and uh, journalists that it might not be such a stupid idea. We have an exceptional political environment uh, which can put you in difficult situations where you must uh, yeah. choose the lesser of the two evils. Yeah, I, I respect that. And, and I think it is right that people are asking this. And I would, I would say two things there. One, I'm not sure that it's in the best interest at a national level to have the instability that we've seen at local government level. 
Um, South Africa's economy is in a very fragile state uh, that I think it, as an emerging market economy, whilst countries like Italy and, and the UK and others can survive changing prime ministers and presidents more often than the tide changes, I don't think our country can afford that instability at a national level. So I think that what I think what analysts are doing is looking at stability and how we inject that stability uh, into the situation. The second point I'd say is that we must be careful that in seeking stability, we don't do what the MDC did to ZANU-PF in Zimbabwe, where essentially they breathed life into a rotting carcass and simply extended the life of that terrible organization, ZANU-PF. So, as I said, there's going to have to be a great deal of introspection and a great deal of, of thinking um, by political parties to establish how do you build stability um, so that we can build on something that's going to get South Africa onto a new trajectory of hope, prosperity, inclusiveness, and, and, uh, and growth. But at the same time, how do you do so in, uh, in a way that doesn't just simply extend the life um, of the ANC. It will also is that come down to a third factor, which I think we will start to see uh, the outcome of in December is, well, what is the ANC? What does the ANC look like? In December, there's going to be victors and vanquish. There are going to be people who, who leave. There may be breakaways from the ANC. And those who say it's never broken, the, the ANC has never split before. It has split. The UDM was a split from the ANC. COPE was a split from the ANC and the EFF was a breakaway of the of the youth wing. So I think there is another split coming in the ANC and they will only serve to weaken it further and uh, I think open up more options. So it'll also come down to, you know, there may well be new entrants and new players by the time 2024 rolls around. So I'm not putting anything off the table at this stage other than it would be impossible for us to work with the EFF. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that an EFF ANC tie up, I think would be uh, astronomically bad for the country um, and, and we would work from that. But it is a debate that we should be having. And I think that you and other journalists are, are well within your, your rights to be asking these questions. So, you know, well, what are the permutations and what would work best? Because I think what we all want is a stable, growing, prosperous South Africa. Um, I don't think we want to see chaos and I don't think we want to see disorder. Every morning we wake up uh, with chaos, uh, around us, the the ANC has broken this country down in in every way you can think of, um, uh, and and one must be very cautious not to become too negative. But but mm. it's all around us. Correct. Do you think? Do you really believe we can turn this around and change it? Because sometimes I must admit, mm. I really really get despondent. Yeah, it is by a makkelijk in Zuid-Afrika moedeloos te raak, want daar is soveel wat, wat is verkeerd in ons land. Maar, so my oma had altyd vir my gesê, daar is altyd hoop. And there is always hope. And I fundamentally believe that we can turn things around, Isaac, and that it's not too late. I'm not sure whether in another five years of the current trajectory, there will be much left to, to fix. Uh, which is why there is an urgency over this next election. But if I look at broken municipalities that we've picked up and turned around, um, I look at the great work that Chris Pappas has done in our first municipality we've governed in KwaZulu-Natal, which was really a, a broken, failed municipality. It's now debt-free. Uh, the potholes are being fixed. The municipality is back on its feet again. That it can be done, but it's going to require a huge result and it's going to require the efforts, not just of political parties, of everybody in South Africa, civil society, in uh, business, the whole of society approach. But I think if, look, I mean, we're an incredible nation of people. Um, if one looks at, at the history and stories of all cultures, it is a story richly woven in a tapestry of huge adversity and how these were overcome. And We've done it on so many occasions before. Even when people have written us off, we've surprised them. I think we can do it again. And I don't think I'd be doing what I do. And I don't think you'd be doing what you do, actually, um, if there wasn't a burning uh, hope uh, that, there is, that, you know, that there is a future and that we can achieve it. 
uh, if we make the right decisions, put the right people in the right places, you can have that outcome. And I think that's what gets me out of bed every morning. I don't know where this editor of Mail and Guardian gets his uninspiring. You just were so inspiring. <laughs> thank you. Here thank you very much. No, very, not, a, not a dry piece of toast in sight. <laughs> <laughs> John Steenhuisen, thank you very, very much. It's thank always you, a pleasure sir. talking to you. Thank you for making time uh, for Nispot. Uh, I know you have a busy, busy schedule, but we appreciate it very much that you talk to us. Well, bye, thank you, Isaac. And ons waardeer die wonderlijke werk wat jy in die pers doen om seker te maak dat ons ons werk doen en ons bly op ons toene. So, en bye, bye, dank jy vir die geleentheid en, en bye, dank jy aan amal wat ingesluit het uh, om te kyk. Ek kan nie wacht vir die volgende keer um, en ek sal die kaptein brand baie geniet. Die spot, die thuiste vir Afrikaanse stories achter die news.